Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Lynn and today I have this really awesome project that I want to share. This is a perpetual calendar. I had the idea of it one night and I just had to start working on it straight away. It took a couple of nights of uh, working into the wee hours of the morning to get this done because I, I was just so excited to see it all to come together and it takes a little bit of prep work because with perpetual calendars, the idea is that you can use it all year long and just flip the numbers and rotate them to indicate the month and the day. And so there are a lot of individual elements that are identical to each other. So it's not that it was a hard project to put together, just a lot of, a lot of cutting and uh, some pretty specialized cuts too. So let's make this. I am going to start off with the month. So this piece of heavyweight cardstock is 110 pound. I've cut it to six and a half inches high by eight and a half inches wide. Along that eight and a half inch edge, I gave myself a little tick mark one and three eighths of an inch inward from the left and from the right edge. And then I gave myself another little pencil mark three and three quarters of an inch down from the top. If you have a trimmer like I do here, this is the We Are Memory Keepers All-in-One. I love it. It's in my standard list of supplies in my description box. You actually don't need the, the pencil marks, but even knowing that, I still like to have them because you do have on the that teal sort of um, guide there, the track that the blade slides down, there's a ruler. So you can actually see, and the trimmer itself has a uh, engraved line where that indicates where the blade is. So you can actually see you know, how far down you're cutting. And that's why I put that bit of washi so that it's even easier to see. So you don't need the pencil marks, but if you like having them, which I do, once you've got one cut, you can just use that as a template to transfer those cutting lines. And so that's another, I, I actually use both. I like seeing the pencil marks on the project because it's a nice visual, uh, easy, visual indicator to tell me to kind of slow down. Um, but once you get those first two slits, you can connect those bottom edges to remove that piece uh, in the center there entirely. Keep those though. We will use them as the individual uh, numbered flip tiles. And yes, this is the new Tim Holtz rotary media trimmer. I wanted to do this project um, and uh, try this trimmer out with chipboard, which I'll use in a little bit to create the stand for the perpetual calendar. But um, these little tiles that I just cut down, they are two and a half wide by three and a half tall. Okay, so here is some medium weight chipboard. This is from Graphic 45 and I actually didn't measure it to know if this is falls within the recommended um, <laughs> weight, uh, maximum weight that um, the rotary trimmer recommends, but I, I tried it anyways. I don't cut, th so the reason why I'm, I got the rotary trimmer, because I do love my guillotine. If I need super straight, super clean cuts, my guillotine is my go-to. The We Are Memory Keeper, I um, find that I have to replace the blade pretty often. It's, it's super sharp, gives great cuts, nice and clean um, at the beginning of a new blade, <laughs> but after a while you can start to get some fuzzies. Um, but I don't cut chipboard on either of those. And so I wanted to test this out on some chipboard and it cuts really well. I mean, it sounds kind of scary going through, but it, um, be just because of that crunch, you know, but it's, uh, it actually, it went through it just fine. And 
I don't show it on camera, but you know those infomercials where they're selling knives and they cut through like a like a boot or something, and then they go and slice a tomato. I kind of did the same thing, so I I cut through the chipboard, and then straight afterwards I cut through some copy paper. <laughs> I guess that's sort of the equivalent, and uh, it cut through just fine. It, it actually um, it still s seemed super sharp the blade. Okay. And, and that is the reason why I don't use my um, guillotine or my all-in-one trimmer to cut chipboard because it, it has the it can have that tendency to dull your blade um, if you if you do that a lot. Okay, so um, I was chatting about other things, but the other two pieces that I cut from chipboard. So that first piece, six and three quarters by nine, you'll need two, and then you'll also need two pieces that measure one and three quarters by nine. And so total for the stand, we're gonna need four pieces. So two pieces that measure six and three quarters by nine, two pieces that measure one and three quarter by nine. And for decorating the months, uh, the flips tabs for the months, I am using the Graphic 45 Flower Market Collection. Such a gorgeous, gorgeous paper collection. And I, you could definitely do this up a lot more than what I've um, chosen for this project. I'm keeping it really simple because I think I'm going to give this to my mom and I, uh, she just loves flowers and I don't think she really needs to necessarily know that every month actually has a flower that's associated with it. Because I'm using the 8x8 um, paper pad because this strip here with the month is 8 inches wide by 2 and a quarter tall. And I'm using the side of the paper that has the floral print. And I want to show, even though this is a calendar project, that it's just, these are just gorgeous papers. And so you can just use them as florals. You don't actually need to... You don't actually need to make a calendar project and use it in that um, sense where you're actually, you know, using maybe the um, backside that has all the cut aparts with the different calendar elements and it has the name of the flower. Uh, you don't you don't have to use it for that at all. You can just use it for the the really pretty <laughs> pattern paper that it is. So that's sort of um, the vein that I was looking at this in. I actually might do this with the Life's a Bowl of Cherries paper collection because I think that would be another bright, fun one. I, I really like to use bright papers that are cheerful for things like um, storage organization or desk um, things like this perpetual calendar that's going to be kind of in your room, something that you look at every day. It's just nice, I feel, to have something really, really bright and cheerful. And so this uh, paper collection and I think Life's a Bowl of Cherries, I think would be really, really good for it too. So uh, I will definitely be making more of these just because they make fantastic gifts. And even though it's a calendar, what I love is that you can really give it any time of year. You don't have to give it like at the end of the year so that, you know, they can start off their January with a fresh new calendar. It's a perpetual calendar. So you can use it, you know, at you know, any time, the next day that you get it and just flip to the month and the day. Um, and so that's, that's the really great thing about perpetual calendars as a gift. The downside though, is that, you know, it is a perpetual calendar. So you can only give... A perpetual calendar so many times to the same person because the idea is you don't you shouldn't need more than one <laughs> but maybe you have like an office at home and you have an office you know at um you have to go into an office as well so you've got a desk there too and maybe it's nice to to have calendars on on um both your desk I suppose but um but it's it's a fantastic gift that is it comes together pretty quickly now for me this first one took 
a bit of time because I was sort of figuring it out as I was going. But once you have all of the dimensions for everything figured out, it, it does come together fairly quickly. These added strips of uh, paper here, they are from the patterns and solids from the flower market collection. And I've cut those to one and three eighths by three and three quarters tall. So one and three eighths wide by three and three quarters tall. And I wanted to add that to, again, brighten up the project a little bit because I am using black as my base layer. And I'm thinking this is gonna go to my mom. She loves florals, she loves gardening and, uh, what she doesn't love so much is dark colors <laughs> and black. But I I chose black because often against bright colors, black actually helps to make all of the bright colors stand out more. And then as well, because I use this die set, which uh, alphabet die set, which is designed to be used the way that I've used it here, where you're using the negative, you can use the positive letters that fall out as well. So there's a little bit of a double duty there, but it's designed in such a way that it's, um, it's really, I think it looks its best when you use the negative because it's got those extra slashes for the shadow. And I really want to make this nice and legible. Um, so that's why I wanted to use a nice big bold font. And it's the reason that I came up with this design because I wanted, there were a couple things that in um, perpetual calendars that I've made in the past that I wanted to kind of improve upon. One was in the past, I've used rather small numbers and that was to keep the project um, not super wide because I was stacking month, you know, and then the, the date. And for the date, you need two, two flip tiles because there's two digits um, to represent all 31 days. And so um, that's why I came up with having the month at the bottom, but it's going to operate on its own set of um, binding so that you can flip it independent of the numbers. And then that way I can actually use more height as well um, and have these larger, larger font um, alphabet and number uh, dies. Because they are large, they're like two inches tall, uh, the numbers. So it's really, really great and nice and bold, so easy to read. And the black also helps uh, with the contrast so that it you can read it from afar too if you need it to kind of glance um, from across the room. So how I like to, these are the numbered uh, flip tiles here. And once I have one centered and positioned, I um, assembled the tile and then I just use my T-square ruler to line up that bottom edge so that all of the numbers are are at least aligned um, with each other at the bottom. Left to right, I just eyeball, you know, I, it's not a wide distance, so it's easy enough to eyeball. And if it's not 100% center centered, I'm not I'm not going to be mad at it. It's um, it's handmade, so I think it's fine. <laughs> now, the tile, again, the tile itself, that black layer measures two and a half wide by three and a half tall, uh, basically the size of an ATC, if you're familiar with that. And then the pattern paper measures two and one eighth wide by three and one eighth tall. And when I go to add my pattern paper layer on top of the black base. I did this with um, the those um, patterns and solid strips on the monthly flip tabs, but I didn't explain why. Um, across the top, I put two lines of double-sided dry adhesive and then just one line of double-sided dry adhesive on the other three edges. And the reason for that is because at the top edge, I'm going to actually punch some holes through there, and that's where our loop, our loop binding will go. 
And so I just want to make sure that there's full adhesive all the way around those cut circles. It just helps to kind of really make sure that um, it's nice and secure, doesn't come apart. And I don't want to get, I don't want to get um, liquid adhesive up there because, well, my hope was that I was <laughs> going to be able to punch through these as soon as um, I had them assembled. And so I didn't want to risk punching through wet adhesive and maybe like gumming up my um, cutting the punching, um, whole, the whole punches of my cinch. So that was the other reason. Um, if you use liquid adhesive, that's totally fine. Just make sure that you're giving it ample time to completely dry through so that you, you don't, you're not punching through any wet adhesive. That would be the only thing. Okay. So time to pull out the cinch. I love, I love my cinch. This is the larger size. And anytime I do any cinch work, I always make a paper template first. So my template is just from copy paper cut to the same dimensions, two and a half wide by three and a half tall. I put a centering tick mark, pencil mark at the bottom. And my blue tape is right, it marks the center of the cinch. And this way I can center my holes. It just needs four holes. So on the other two ends of those four holes, I made sure to pull the pegs out. That way I don't get any extra partial hole punches on the edge of my project. So with the original size cinch, you have that ability. The mini cinch does not let you do that. You can't pull pegs out and decide which holes punch and which don't. So that's why I really love this cinch for um, not just the, the fact that it's large and if you you know, are doing like a full on notebook, it's just easy and convenient. You can just punch all the holes in one go. But for highly custom cinch work like this is going to be, it having the ability to pull pegs in and out, decide what punches and what doesn't is really, really helpful. So here I'm punching through my monthly flip tabs and I just want to punch the first two holes. So holes three and four I pulled out. Um, really you just need to pull out hole three um, because that's the only one that has any kind of danger of possibly punching. And once you punch one side, flip it over to the back and you can punch the other side. So that's um, just part of the cinch work. There will be some more um, <laughs> cinching that we do in a bit. Before we get to that, though, um, to create the stand. Now, this is the medium weight chipboard piece that was cut to six and three quarters tall by nine inches wide. There's two of them, but I'll just show you how to wrap the one and you do the exact same thing with the other. I like to put double-sided dry adhesive all the way around as close to the edge as possible and then squiggle on some liquid adhesive in the center. If this was a mini album, I would be using a an acid-free archival safe um, adhesive, but this no photos will touch this, so I don't mind using my um, adhesives that are not acid free. Otherwise I would be using um, my Lanco pH neutral because that's my favorite glue. <laughs> but I'm going to just give uh, the edges here a nice burnish. The black cardstock I'm using is not the heavyweight stuff. This is 80 pound which I think is great. It's You want a little bit thinner. 65 is fine too. Um, that's just going to help prevent cracking as you fold that edge over to wrap the chipboard. And you could use a dry adhesive here as well, but I just like to use a nice uh, liquid adhesive. I, I like to draw that line down right against the chipboard. It does help to soften the um, that edge a little bit. And as you wrap it around, the if as you wrap the solid color cardstock around, it gives it a nice finish. I did also miter the corners, and when you are mitering, mitering the corners, meaning cutting that triangle off of the corners, what that does is it just reduces the bulk, because if you did not remove it, there would be a lot of overlapping cardstock right in that corner. But when you cut off that triangle, don't cut too closely to the 
corner of the chipboard because otherwise you're not going to have enough cardstock to actually cover the corner and you'll have an exposed corner. So you saw, I just eyeballed it. You just cut, you know, maybe around 45 degrees and just eyeball maybe about an eighth of an inch from the corner. That should be plenty. You will definitely need at least the thickness of your chipboard uh, to make sure that's covered. And there will be two of those pieces, the six and three quarters by nine. With these two pieces, um, these are the two that measure one and three quarter tall by nine inches wide. And these are going to be what connects the sort of the back cover of our stand and the front cover of our stand. And it's going to form a little bit <clears throat> of a, um, it's going to form a little bit of a mountain that gives us that sort of zigzag at the bottom so that it's nice and stable. So I'm going to actually cover them with the same piece of 80 pound solid color black cardstock, but I want to leave space in between the, the two long edges because the, the chipboard has some thickness to it. And how I'm gauging the spacing is I've just, um, <laughs> just stacked up four sheets of chipboard and, um, use that to, to kind of, uh, leave that gap in between those two pieces. And I'm going to miter these corners too, but I'm going to do a little bit of a soft mitering because not all four edges will fold over to wrap this, um, these two chipboard pieces. I'm only going to wrap, uh, over the, uh, short edges. And the two long edges are actually going to be glue tabs that will attach this piece to the front cover and to the back cover to form our stand. And this is generally how I would wrap a mini album too. If you've ever seen any of my mini album videos, you'll, you'll probably know that. Um, normally this would be the spine and it would just be the one piece, but we need this to kind of do that little V fold so that it stabilizes the stand. And then when I glue these two flaps over, I just want to make sure that I burnish because we have a gap in between there. So I just want to make sure I push um, that cardstock down, burnish it in and make sure that that's well stuck as well. And then when it comes to folding this, you're going to fold it um, almost like a W or an M. So I initially folded, <clears throat> folded it the wrong way, but what I want is the pretty side, the wrap side to be on the outside. So you want um, in the center there, you want to make that a valley fold and then you want two um, mountain folds. And so you'll get something that looks a little bit like this. And that's a dry fit of all the pieces coming together. So on these flaps here, I am going to put some double-sided dry adhesive on the those two long flaps right on the edge as close to, as it as to the edge as I can get and then just a little bit off from the edge of the chipboard where that fold is and um, that way I can get adhesive as close to the edges as possible to make sure that there isn't any kind of um, you know it doesn't kind of uh, peel or lift from the edges. And then I'll just squiggle some liquid adhesive in the center. Liquid adhesive is always going to be more permanent than your double-sided dry adhesive. So for projects like these, where it's a perpetual calendar. So the idea is that, you know, you would use it year after year. So I want to make sure that it's going to last. It's still paper at the end of the day. So it still can tear. It still can... Um, uh, kind of wear down over time, but at least um, it's going to last as long as I it um, can with some liquid adhesive. Double-sided dry adhesive, depending on the climate, it can um, the effects of it are 
more dramatic than um, other climates, like humid climates, for sure. Your double-sided dry adhesive can actually just dry out completely and lose all of its stickiness. So that's why the liquid adhesive. With the liquid adhesive, a water-based one, like a good PVA glue or craft glue, it's going to actually um, soak into your papers and, and create a more permanent bond. Now, strictly speaking, I don't know that you need to cover the inside of the stand because once this is all cinched together, it's never going to be flat like this again. And you won't ever really see the inside of the stand, but this is going to my mom and she she will look <laughs> because she she appreciates um anything handmade anything one of a kind whether it's you know sewing projects or paper craft projects or wood craft anything I and mean, she's just very appreciated appreciative of craftsmanship of any form and part of that appreciation comes from just an inquisitive nature of how things are put together, you know, looking at the fit and finish of things. And so I know she'll she'll take a peek and she'll look. And by adding just these extra couple of panels to cover up the glue tabs just makes this a little bit neater on the inside, even if there's a very little chance it gets seen. And if it does get seen, it'll, it'll be seen the one time, really. And that's it. Um, just out of curiosity. Because once this is folded, especially since it's all black on black, very little of um, the exposed uh, glue tabs will, will be seen. But all the same, I do like to keep everything as you know polished as possible. Partly because I, I have I share a little bit of that nature with my mom of, you know, just really looking at things closely just to learn, you know, how was this made so that I can learn how to make it. And um and so with this piece though, it's I scored this piece measures uh three and a half wide by eight and a half tall, but I scored three or four times in the center just to have a little bit of a gusset because this wraps around uh, two pieces of chipboard. And so I want to make sure that there's, um, it's actually, you know, curving around that thickness. One score line is not going to really cut it because that doesn't really represent the thickness um, that that has to, that section has to cover. So again, same thing, um, double-sided dry adhesive all the way around the edge just so that it can, um, I can get glued all the way to the edge and not have to worry about messy liquid adhesive. But I do want to squiggle on some liquid adhesive for the permanency of it. And, um, and that way I get both, you know, adhesive all the way to the, around the edges where there's probably the most um, kind of danger of anything lifting or, or peeling up but I get the permanency of the liquid adhesive. And that's the cover complete. So now to bring it all together, we gotta we have to cinch all of this together and, um, and bind it with some wire loop binding. Now, this is going to be pretty customized because I, I thought of the sizing of my flip tabs first. And I'm going to adjust my binding and customize my binding to match my design. That was just the first way I thought to do it. Now, having done this the one time, I think I might go back and maybe fit my design of the flaps and everything to uh, the more standard spacing of holes. And that way I can maybe um, save myself some of the custom cinch work I'm about to show because then it'll probably be easier for if you wanted to do this to, um, to uh, give it a go as well. Because what I'm going to show is how I created, and I, I guess this is useful too, um, to know that you can do your own kind of custom cinch work, but it's uh it takes a little bit of trial and error 
and in particular this part here. That's why I always recommend using a template. So I've cut down some just scrap um, copy paper and this is nine inches wide. So this is the width of my stand. And what I want to do is position all of my elements. So the monthly flap, the two number flaps, and I just drew with my pencil where I need to punch holes. And I figured that out with the um, by just tilting my cinch upwards. This is hard to do on camera um, <laughs> so that you can see, um, but I'll show you in a bit. I, I realized before I move that left hand guide, since I moved that left hand guide initially to the perfect position for punching these first two holes, I wanted to make sure that I go ahead and punch all of the holes that I need. So that was my cover piece that I punched. Now this is my stand. So I line it up, I punch, I flip it to the back, I line it up, I punch. That was the front cover. And this is the back cover, I do the exact same thing. You punch, flip it over to the back, punch again. And that gives you the left side holes and the right side holes. Things are gonna be mirrored. So once you figure out the position for the set of two holes, you can, <clears throat> you can mirror that. <clears throat> Excuse me, you can mirror that and punch um, the same set of two on the right side. Okay, so here's how I figure out the four holes. Um, and it's, I did the same with the two holes. So you um, kind of tilt your cinch up and start to punch downward so that you can see where the punches, where the metal of the hole punch is coming through. And then I just lined up my circles against that. And the reason to do this with copy paper is so that if you don't get it right on your first go, you can try again and you haven't punched anything um, through your permanent, you know, your final project. And um, you'll find in a bit that I, I do end up making a mistake and, and having to redo <laughs> um, the cover piece. But I'll, I'll talk about that when I get to that. So the first set of holes that I did for the four, uh, they weren't exactly how I wanted. So I'm starting on an, a fresh kind of set uh, or edge of my template. And that's the beauty. If you get this wrong, it's just copy paper. So just trim off that. Uh, you'll see me do that in a moment because it takes me um, a second or a third go at it. It's a lot easier to do than what I'm making it out to be. It's just hard to do on camera where I can tilt this so that you can see things. Um, but basically what I do is I look to line up my holes on my template. <laughs> that one I got way off. Um, I look to line up the holes on my template with the hole punch. So if you get it off, don't worry, just trim it off. And um, it's just copy paper so you can try again. Um, and one thing um, that I'm that's different with these sets of four and um, or all of these holes that I'm punching through my cover piece is that I'm using that left hand guide and I'm sliding that in and out so that I have something to actually kind of butt up against. And here I didn't like how this looked. I didn't get the spacing quite right. There's a little bit too much space in the center between the two number flaps and I did punch through my cover piece. So I don't want to make that cover again. So what I did was I just took another piece of black cardstock, figured out where the holes should be. And now I'm just punching a sheet of plain black cardstock. And with my original cover piece that has the uh, holes that are not the alignment that I want, I just trim those holes off and then I'll glue it to this piece. So you can sort of save a project um, and that's why I did the cover first because the cover measures the same as the stand, which is what I'm punching through now. So here I'm actually punching through the stand, um, those four holes. So I punch once, 
flip it over to the back side and I punch again. And then I punch the back uh, cover the exact same way. Punch once, flip it over to the back and punch a second time. Here's that cover piece. Now that the uh, holes are perfect, I've trimmed off the original holes from my original cover, and now I'm going to save this cover piece by uh, just attaching it to a new set of, um, uh, a new, an extra layer of cardstock, basically, that has the new set of holes. So um, with a cover piece like this, that's just, you know, single cardstock, not a big deal, uh, you can trim, trim off, you know, if you uh, misprint, mispunch something, but you want to be careful punching through your stand because that's got the wrapped chipboard and it took some time to assemble that. So definitely try to get it right on something that is, um, you know, you something that you can toss like copy paper and if not something that you can very easily kind of um, put back together like the cover page. So that's the order that I kind of punch things in. <laughs> Here is the wire loop binding normally sold as strips or lengths of I think maybe like 11 inches because it is meant to bind full notebooks like US letter size notebooks. So I all I did is I just snipped down uh, four lengths of loops. So two of, um, two sets, uh, of two, basically. Um, I'm gonna have one set that has just two loops and then, um, one set of two that has four loops. And that is so that each of our, um, the month flips and the, uh, number flip tabs are going to be hung by these loops and they can actually flip independently. So I've stacked all of my months. My cover is at the, um, this is basically stacked from top to bottom, um, front to back in order. So we have the cover and then January through December. And then I put on my back, my stand. And the reason I do it in this order, so the stand is on top of my front cover. The reason for this is so that when you go to close down the loops on the cinch here, it's on the back. When you go to close this down, the seam of your loops will be hidden on the back cover uh, of the stand. And that way it's less visible. And it'll, it's going to be basically completely hidden because that cover, it reads, you are loved. And it's just from the letters that fell out from punching all of the months. And um, you're only going to really see that the one time. And then once you're using the calendar, unless you want to flip back just to read that little lovely message, um, you're probably not going to see it again. And so... By cinching in that order, we hide the seam of the uh, wires between the cover piece and the uh, stand. Okay, so again, I'm going to order all of my numbers, um, you know, from one, that first set goes from one to three, it represents the tens digit of the number, and then the um, singles digit is ordered from zero at the bottom to then nine, eight, seven, you know, et cetera, all the way to one at the top. So from the top, it goes from one to nine and then zero. And I'm gonna order it the exact same way and then cinch each of these uh, sets of loops. So our numbers are bound by the uh, stretches of loops that are four holes. And then the month is bound by um, two loops of two on both sides so that they all can kind of flip um, independently. And then this does fold down. So you can mail this if you wanted to put it in maybe a padded envelope, it would mail just fine. And I've got the cover just so that you can see something pretty when you first receive it. But really, like I said, you probably won't see that again once you're using it. And here you can see all of that gorgeous um, florals and you can do 
you can do this um, with any papers, really. I might do this with, um, like I said, with uh, light visible cherries because bright papers like these for um, things that are, at least for me, around my desk, around my office, I feel it's just nice and cheerful to have uh, something nice and bright like this. And my mom loves flowers and florals, and so I think she'll she'll really enjoy this. And especially having a um, the font so large makes it really easy to read, easy to glance at if you're across the room and you just want to know you know what what today's date is. So the idea is you just flip, you know, as the days go by, you just flip the tiles and then, you know, when you get to the end, there is the number zero at the bottom. And then you can flip all the way back to one again when um, it crosses over from, say, the ninth to the tenth or the tenth to the eleventh. So um, it's flexible. You can represent all 31 days of the month, all 12 months of the year, and um, it stands beautifully it's nice and stable and it's just a fun project to put together um so I'll, I'll leave links to everything that i used for this project in the description box below i hope that you enjoyed it i will try this again but with um maybe some less custom cinch work and uh and so look forward to that video in the future thanks so much until next time happy crafting and have a fantastic day bye